Bismillahirrahmanirrahim and uh, welcome back to this next video and this is the uh, fifth video of the chapter 2 in immunology. Uh, we are discussing about the granulocytes and the agranulocytes and in my previous videos I told you about the granulocytes, about the agranulocytes and about their uh, important differences. Then we start our discussion on the neutrophils and in my last video I have told you that the neutrophils they belong to the granulocytes and they are the most abundant of the circulating leukocytes and uh, they are produced in the bone marrow in a very large number like in billions per day and uh, they get differentiated in the bone marrow after their differentiation they move to the uh, peripheral blood uh, from where they move into the uh, tissue and in the tissue they have a lifespan of like a few days if you talk about their characteristic i've told you that they are very small like they have uh, like they are 10 to 12 micrometer in diameter and their nucleus is multi-lobed therefore we uh, place them into a particular class of the leukocytes which are known as the uh, polymorphonuclear leukocytes uh, then I've told you about the uh, GEMSA stain, that this uh, GEMSA stain uh, is actually going to, uh, you can see, stain these uh, neutrophils for their differentiation from the other blood cells and they actually look like uh, this uh, pink purple uh, when you stain them. Uh, then I told you about the uh, granidopoiesis, which is actually the uh, production uh, of the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils. And I gave you a detailed discussion on that, how this uh, granidopoiesis, it works. Now, in this particular video, I want to focus on another important characteristic of the neutrophils, uh, which is the uh, presence of the granules. As I've told you that the neutrophils, they belong to the class of the granulocytes that means they are going to have these granules now these granules they actually come in four flavors when you talk about the neutrophils uh, one they are known as the primary granules or sometimes they are also known as the xerophilic granules and i tell you the reason why we call them is the xerophilic granules uh, the second class of the granules that you can see in the neutrophils, they are known as the secondary granules. They are sometimes also known as the specific granules. Uh, the third one, they are known as the tertiary granules and they are also known as the uh, uh, gelatinase granules. Uh, and the last one, they are known as the uh, secretory granules. Now these granules, they are produced in uh, different stages of the uh, differentiation of neutrophils. I told you about the different stages of differentiation of neutrophils in my last video and I'll share the uh, link in the description if you are interested uh, in learning more about the differentiation of the neutrophils. So these primary granules, uh, when you talk about the neutrophils and their differentiation stage, they are actually produced when the uh, neutrophils, they move from the uh, myeloblast to the promyelocyte stage. The secondary granules, they are produced when the uh, neutrophils, they move from the uh, uh, myelocyte to the metamyelocyte stage. The tertiary granules, they are produced in the band cell stage. And the secretory granules, they are actually produced when the uh, neutrophils, they are in their mature stage. And this is actually the figure that I discussed in the uh, last video. As you can see over here, these granules that actually start, they are actually starting to produce in the uh, promyelocyte. So you're talking about the primary granules over here. So the uh, talk about the secondary one, as you can see over here, when the uh, uh, neutrophils, they move from the myelocyte to the metamyelocyte, you can see these uh, secondary granules over here. The tertiary one, you can see them in the uh, band cells and these uh, secretory granules, they are in the um, mature neutrophils and then they are released into the uh, blood circulation. I'll talk about these uh, granules in detail uh, and I'll give you about the composition of these granules and I'll give you the uh, functions of the, uh, like if you talk about like, the composition of these uh, granules, they have got different kind of the enzymes different kind of the proteins and they have got distant functions. So we are going to uh, discuss them in detail. So we'll start our discussion with the primary granules. Now if you see, uh, if you talk about these uh, primary granules, uh, they are also known as the xerophilic granules. Why we call them as the uh, xerophilic granules is uh, because this uh, xerophilic is actually a, a Greek word that is made up of two terms. One is known as the azuro 
and this azuro refers to blue and this fellows actually means uh, loving so what that means is that uh, when you are going to stain these primary granules with certain dyes like the right stain uh, that means that when you stain them with this particular stain uh, these uh, azurophilic granules or these primary granules they are going to appear blue or violet under a microscope so as they love to appear in the blue or in the violet color therefore we call them is the uh, azurophilic granules now this uh, azurophilic granules or these primary granules they have got a lot of antimicrobial uh, you can say proteins and a lot of antimicrobial agents uh, I'll be focusing on like the most important of them and I'll be talking about the uh, myeloperoxidases, about the uh, defensins, about the uh, lysozymes and uh, the elastase protein and the uh, catapsins. So if you talk about the composition of the primary granules, you are going to find these things in the uh, azurophilic or in the primary granules. Of course, there are other things in the azurophilic granules as well, but I'll be focusing on these one because they are very important when you talk about the uh, antimicrobial properties of these primary or the uh, azurophilic granules. In this particular video, I'll only be focusing on the uh, functions of the myeloperoxidases and I'll talk about the functions of these uh, other antimicrobial agents uh, in the coming videos. So let us talk about the uh, myeloperoxidase in a little bit detail. How they exert their antimicrobial properties. How they help the immune system in killing a particular pathogen. Now these myeloperoxidases, they are responsible for the uh, production of the uh, reactive oxygen species. And these uh, reactive oxygen species, they are one of the most potent antimicrobial agents that the body can produce. Now these uh, reactive oxygen species, how they are produced? So when you talk about the myeloperoxidate, what it do is that it is going to use the hydrogen peroxide. It is going to take the chloride from the cellular fluid. So the myeloperoxidase, when it acts on the hydrogen peroxide and the chloride ions, it is going to produce this hypochlorous acid and this hypochlorous acid is going to act on the pathogen to kill this particular pathogen or to degrade this particular pathogen thereby preventing the body from infection. Now how this hypochlorous acid is going to kill the pathogen? When you talk about this hypochlorous acid, it is a very strong oxidizing agent and I hope you know about the oxidizing agent that those particular agent which gain electron from their substrate they are known as the oxidizing agent by that I mean that when these oxidizing agents they react with something they are going to attract the electrons from that particular substrate thereby um, uh, you can say reducing itself and oxidizing the uh, uh, substrate agent now when we talk about this strong oxidizing agent about this hypochlorous acid so how it is going to act as an oxidizing agent now this uh, uh, you can say hypochlorous acid what it do is it is going to act on the proteins especially the cysteine it is going to uh, you can say uh, work as an oxidizing agent on the self hydro group of the cysteine amino acid then when the self hydro group that has been oxidized it leads to the formation of the disulfide bonds and this disulfide bond actually leads to the uh, cross linking of the proteins these uh, hypochlorous acid also work on the methionine and it is using the sulfur groups of the methionine to oxidize them now when these uh, cysteines and the methionines uh, when they get uh, uh, oxidized by the hypochlorous acid it actually leads to the protein aggregation and protein aggregation would simply mean that these particular proteins are not available for the functions of that particular pathogen and without the proteins the pathogen is not able to survive so this is one way how the uh, myeloperoxidase it can actually help kill the pathogen that has entered into your body by oxidizing the cysteine and the methionines of the proteins thereby leading to the protein aggregation secondly as i've told you that this hypochlorous acid is a very strong oxidizing agent it also acts on the nucleic acids 
and when you talk about the nucleic acid that when you are talking about the uh, dna and the rna and in the dna and the rna what this hypochlorous acids do is that it acts on the nucleobases thereby oxidizing them and you all know that when you talk about the dna you've got the adenine guanine cytosine and thymine and when you talk about the rna you have got the adenine guanine cytosine but instead of the thymine you have got the uracil so the hypochlorous acid is going to act on these nucleobases when it acts on these nucleobases and it oxidizes them what is the end result now the end result is that you have you are going to get the modified bases by that i mean like if you talk about the uh, uh guanine in the dna the uh, oxid uh, the uh, oxidation of those particular guanine that is going to lead to the formation of the eight oxoguanine and when this eight oxoguanine that is made it actually result in the mismatches during the replication and the transcription and that would simply mean that the process of the replication and the transcription that is going to get affected and these are very important for the survival of the pathogen so if these replication and transcription doesn't work properly you are killing the pathogen secondly this hypochlorous acid that is going for the base hydrolysis and it is going to do it is going for the hydrolysis of the glycosidic bond and this glycosidic bond is actually responsible for the formation of the sugar phosphate backbone and this sugar phosphate backbone is going to be to give integrity to the uh, dna and the rna so when you damage this sugar phosphate backbone you are actually damaging the integrity of the nucleic acid structure now when the uh, nucleic acid structure that has been damaged the process of the replication and the transcription that has been damaged that means that you are going for the protein aggregation as i've told you that the hypochlorous acid is going for the uh, oxidation of the cysteine and the methionine leading to the protein aggregation this hypochlorous acid when it acts on the dna and the rna by producing the modified bases by going for the hydrolysis of the bases so the collective uh, end result is the uh, cell death, the uh, cell that is going to die. So this is how the myeloperoxidase is, they are going to kill the uh, pathogens. Now in my next video, I'll be talking about more on the uh, functions of the uh, like lysozymes, the uh, catepsins, the other components of the primary granules. So if you like the video, please subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, do ask me questions in the comment section if you have any question and uh, I'll see you in the uh, next video.